Hi, it's Alexis. And Christian from Tiny House Expedition. And we built our tiny house way back in 2014. With the help of friends and family, over nine months of ups and downs and trial and error, it was all worth it in the end. We built a cozy custom home of our own that led us to an adventure of a lifetime. And now we're working on a shuttle bus conversion. In our DIY Tiny Home Build Stories series, we hope to inspire and empower you to take on your own build by yourself or with help. I needed help. I, de <laughs> I definitely needed help. I'm Natalie Bogwalker and I'm the director of Wild Abundance here just outside of Asheville, North Carolina. And this is the tiny house that has evolved into a not so tiny house that I built. So this is the original 12 by 16 cabin and it's made with round logs that are saddle notched for the first floor and then the second floor is stick framed and used to have wool insulation. And then this that you see is the addition that is my daughter's room. And so on the outside, I was not about to do any more log cabin construction, let me tell you. It was great and all, but I was done with that. And so this is just standard insulation and it's board and bat on the outside using all local lumber. And then on the inside, I did a traditional lime plaster with wooden lath. So this is the original build, was this 12 by 16 log cabin. And man, round log log cabins, it's a lot of work, especially if you wanna make it look good, but we'll talk about that later. And then this is the second floor. The second floor I insulated with wool and it had siding on it, it looked great, but then the wool started being eaten. And not just by one type of bug, by two types of bugs, carpet beetles and wool moths and there was wool dust raining on me and polluting the air, like really bad air quality because of all this wool dust. When I had purchased this wool, they told me that it was totally not going to be eaten by bugs because it was impregnated by borax. But unfortunately, I found out firsthand about nine years later that that was not the case. And so instead of tearing out the insulation from the inside, which is what one normally would do, I didn't wanna do that because I loved the interior details and finish work that I'd done. And so I decided instead to pull it out from the outside. So we pulled off the siding, pulled out the wool, sprayed it all with Boracare, put insulation back in and then this is the sheathing and I'm gonna be doing probably shingles up here. This is the box truck and it's an Airbnb and it's a supplemental piece of our income and a place for students to stay when they come take classes here. We converted it, I think it was five years ago and a lot was involved in the conversion. One big thing was painting it into these lovely shades and adding this nice little porch and we have this separate entryway with their own parking spot. More recently, we added this cover to like give some space to the porch and also to preserve the box truck so that it doesn't develop leaks or other things that could damage it over time, protecting our investment. So I welcome you to come on in. So when we got this box truck, it was a typical delivery truck. And so it had a rolling door. So we took that out and framed in a wall. And as you can see, 
a door in that wall. We made the choice to go with drywall for the walls and then we've done earthen paint on those walls, which I think was a really good decision for this box truck, which the engine was no good on it. <laughs> so it's basically going to sit here for a while. And so drywall makes sense for something that is going to stay in one place. It doesn't make sense if you're going to be moving it a lot, but I love the effect of drywall with the earthen paint. I think it just makes it feel so cozy. And we have a blog on our website about the earthen paint. And then the ceiling was already insulated. So we didn't have to do any more framing on the ceiling. And so we just used this really inexpensive sheet beadboard and stained it. And I just love the effect with these little spruce trim boards. I think it just looks lovely with this like slightly arced ceiling. And something I want to mention about the walls is that they had metal steel I-beams in them. And so we just put foam insulation. We stuck it in between those I-beams and then we put like a bubble wrap reflective insulation after that and then did some spacing and then put the drywall on and so that's just kind of so you know what's inside and then we've used some local woods this is cherry and then spruce for the trim on the windows. These are windows that we got really inexpensively. A local glass shop just fabricated these windows for us and then I made the frame of the window just with some cherry. And cherry is a theme. <laughs> in the box track. So we have these really nice countertops. This, they had these hotel bar sinks at Habitat in a granite countertop. And I bought like five of these. And so there's several buildings at Wild Abundance that make use of this little bar sink, which is just perfect for this small space. Here we have some cabinets that a friend made for us and they're just lovely and they really go well with the space. And you know, it's an Airbnb. This space, I think, is too small for like a permanent residence. There's not really a space to do yoga except outside and not really so much of an office space, but it is a perfect Airbnb. And I would be stoked to show up and get an Airbnb for this size. And, you know, I feel great about creating Airbnbs that are made to be Airbnbs instead of taking people's housing and turning them into Airbnbs. So that's something I really love about this space. And it's a generous kitchen for an Airbnb because I love to cook. And so I always create generous kitchens. And then here is more of this cherry countertop, which is lovely and maybe wasn't the best choice for an Airbnb. There's some definitely damage going on from renters putting hot things on the countertop, but live and learn. And then we just have a small amount of space for dishes, which is all that you need for an Airbnb. And that's another thing that's great about creating a space just to be a rental. You don't need a ton of storage space. Whereas if you're creating a space for someone to live in, you do. Over here we have this bench and it is very strategically placed on top of the wheel well. And that's something you really need to think about when you're designing for these tiny spaces that are mobile is there will be a wheel well that comes into a space, which is often super awkward. So I really like having this bench right there and it's really sweet. And then the other wheel well is built into the kitchen. And so we really had to do custom countertops, custom cabinets in order to hide the wheel well. And the little base of the wheel well over here is where the hot water heater sits. And here we have the bed. So this is a little bit narrower than a typical tiny house is. I think this is only seven feet on the outside. And so this bed, something that we write on the Airbnb listing is that this is not appropriate if you are over six foot two. <laughs> So it's a lovely bed for people who are my height and it's just so cozy. This is a little door portal that goes to the front of the box truck. And then recently we installed this little super efficient unit, which is an air conditioner and a dehumidifier, which living in the Southern Appalachians, which is almost a temperate rainforest. It's really nice to have a dehumidifier.
So yeah, I just love the space. It's so cozy and just so warm and classy feeling. And the total cost on it was really low. Like I paid about 1200 bucks for the van. It's, I call it a box truck, but technically it's a step van. I paid about 1200 bucks for it. And I think the total renovations came to under $3,000. So we did really well with it and it brings in a steady stream of income. And I feel really good about being able to offer some something that I would love to stay in when I go on vacation that isn't taking away housing from people in this area. In between the logs is chinking and usually what's done these days with chinking is doing concrete or this elastic type of petroleum product chinking. And so this is old school chinking. And so inside of this, well, this is actually lime plaster. And then below that is cob. This is cob, which is clay, sand, and straw. And then inside of there, there's chinks of wood. That's why it's called chinking. So you basically take a piece of firewood and you split it to be the right size to fit in between two logs. And then you put in a bunch of nails and crooked them over or screws. And then you put the cob on and then you put plaster on top of that. And so the chinks of wood act as a thermal break because if this was all cob, then heat would just pass through the walls. And so you would just have the heat from inside of your home transferring out into the wild, which is not what you want. You want to <laughs> insulate your walls so that the heat can stay in. And so that chinking in there creates a thermal break so that the thermal mass that's in here doesn't become a thermal bridge. It just becomes a place where heat from a wood stove or something like that can absorb heat and then slowly release it into the room. It does take a little while though to heat up all that thermal mass. If you let your house get cold and then you come in and try to make a fire, it'll suck up some of the heat before the room warms up. You'll notice that I have a soapstone windowsill here and that's because south is about right here. And so in the winter time, the leaves drop off of the trees and this is actually a great amount of thermal mass right here where the sun can hit it. And in the summertime, the sun doesn't hit it so it doesn't heat up. And that thermal mass is really important for keeping a space warm. So when your primary source of heat is a wood stove or the sun, having thermal mass is really important because just like if you go to a swimming hole and the sun has shined on a rock all day, that rock will be warm and radiate heat into your body. So this will radiate heat back into the room. And I have passive solar in a couple different parts of my house. Also, when the wood stove is really cranking, it heats up all of this stone, both in the sink and in the countertops. And then later, if I let my fire go out, that stone, as well as the chinking in between the logs of the log cabin, radiates that heat back into the room. And that really makes a big difference in keeping the space cozy. Upstairs is my bedroom and my office. I have this window up here, this Claire Story window. And in the winter time, the sun shines from that Claire Story window onto these slates. And then the heat from the slates radiates into the room. So whenever I can add a passive solar design element into a building, I always do. Passive solar design is something that's been around for thousands of years. And it's bizarre to me that most architecture schools don't even cover it. And you can, not in this particular location on this eastern facing slope, but in many locations, you can heat your house almost exclusively with passive solar. And so it's something that I really encourage you to look into if you have a site where you're doing a permanent build that has southern facing exposure. Oh, man, getting onto raw land and making something of it is a challenge. It's a really big deal. So here at Wild Abundance, I was lucky enough to buy with a few friends and then I was able to bring power and water over here pretty easily and inexpensively because I didn't have much money when I started this land project. And something that I was looking for when I was looking for land was 
a piece of land that either had a house or a trailer that was kind of broken down so it didn't really add value, but it came with a septic tank and a well and grid power. And I mean, I'm all about off-grid power, but it can be pretty expensive. And if you're just getting started on a piece of land, having those basic pieces of infrastructure already there definitely lowers your initial cost. But if you don't have them, you don't have them. So I would say those are some of the biggest challenges. Also road building it can be very expensive. So that's something to really factor in. Like it's great to buy a piece of land that's two miles down a dirt road, but then when you try to develop that road, you might be like, oh, it's gonna be $150,000 to gravel this road up to my building site. So I think before you make a purchase, being really careful to do your research as far as how much it's gonna to cost to get water, whether it's spring fed or whether it's a well, to bring in power, whether it's an off-grid system or whether it's bringing on-grid power and roads and really looking at those and what the expenses are. Design of a tiny house, I think, is one of the most important pieces when it comes to tiny house building. Some people are going to be traveling with that tiny house all over the place, and it should be eight and a half feet wide. But if you're gonna be moving that thing like once or twice in the life of the structure, like go 10 or 12 feet wide because you can move it with like very little expense as far as permits if you're up to definitely 10 or 12 feet. It's sometimes, up, depending on where you are, up to 14 feet. And so I would say like it's so important rather than just buying the tiny house that comes up to really be thinking about how you are going to be using that tiny house and whether the tiny house is going to work for you like is the size of the kitchen appropriate to how much you're going to cook if you are buying a tiny house that someone else is designing being able to have some input on your priorities is really important if you are designing for yourself make sure to go to lots of tiny houses and see how you actually like these features that you might see in plans but seeing them in person is so different and so something I definitely encourage is thinking about the not so tiny house. And so, you know, tiny houses are typically under 400 square feet. I think the like four to 800 square feet range is a place where both single people and familial units can function for a much more sustainable amount of time than trying to cram everything into a tiny space. And I think a lot of the same instincts and principles are at work like, oh, I want to have a low ecological footprint. I think I'll go tiny. And I think that's a great idea, but it also is the same for if you go not so tiny and it's probably going to last longer for you. So yeah, tiny is great, but also consider four to 800 square feet. And our in-person tiny house program and our online tiny house academy, they both are adaptable to the not so tiny house, but we kind of catch people who are in the tiny house fervor. And then we tell them, you know, tiny houses are awesome, but you might want to think about not so tiny because all of us teachers have made that progression from tiny to not so tiny. And so I like to like plant that seed in people's heads that it's not just like bloated giant construction or tiny house. Like there's a very beautiful place in between that is a not so tiny, reasonably sized house. It's Alexis again and Christian from Tiny House Expedition. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And to watch the full tour of the DIY tiny home you just learned about, click over here.